And on something that Adam touched on, these uh, so-called cuts to Medicaid, I, I, I hasten to add that the $800 billion or so Republicans are looking to pay from spending is uh, over an increase in spending. When all is said and done, uh, Medicaid, as it stands now, will still be getting $5.7 trillion. That's how things stand now, closer to $5 trillion if the, the, the cuts come in. So the rate of growth is what slows here. It still means they get more money. And that's the problem with this so-called misnomer that these represent cuts is a big issue for former Reagan budget director David Stockman. We lie when we talk about this stuff, right? Well, uh, unfortunately, this budget will be DBA, dead before arrival, because all these cuts I left in the vault at OMB 36 years ago. Is that right? They were rejected then, you know, the State Department, EPA 30%, cutting back on education, reducing some of the waste in the National Medical uh, uh, Research Institutes, getting rid of the corporation. This was a small sliver yeah, of the that's spending the that you could touch. Right? Yeah, but that's the problem. Uh, Trump has basically ruled out Medicare and Social Security 1.8 trillion a year. He wants more for defense, which is already vastly more than we need. That's 650 billion a year. Interest we have to pay. Veterans he's carved out. That's 200 billion a year. Homeland Security he wants more of in walls. That's 65 billion a year. Uh, uh, law enforcement uh, and so forth is 50 billion and he wants more of that. So the point is they're focused on a smaller and smaller tiny fragment of the budget. You can't make, I would make the myself philosophically but there are no votes for when them. you were doing it back in the yeah. early 80s uh, with Ronald Reagan <clears throat> you ran into a buzzsaw criticism that was heartless and all of this so yeah. what happened in the end well, what happened in the end that there were tiny reforms to Medicaid and food stamps and, and welfare, and then over time, most of that grew back. And the difficulty today, 36 years later, is small ball uh, budget surgery dies with a thousand cuts. They need a big idea. And the big idea is to say Washington takes care of workfare with the earned income tax credit and anybody who gets a job, even at McDonald's, gets some additional help. The states are given responsibility totally for welfare and that means a huge block grant for Medicaid, food stamps uh, and the other well, uh, well, cash assistance programs. Well, let's talk about the food stamps. These days it's hmm. under the umbrella of SNAP, I guess. It's right, a modern version of food stamps. And yet, 44 million receive this type of support for food. Now, no one wants to take food away from people, but the fact is it used to be 28 million as recently as 2008, about 15 million eight years prior to that. So if we have 44 million people in this country who genuinely need this type of support, that's third world country problems, right? I mean, it's even worse. There's 110 million people in this country who live in households that are getting food stamps, Medicaid, or other means-tested assistance. That's one third of the population. But it's always portrayed as you're killing off, you know, grandma or the, the grandchild. Well, uh, look, it's welfareism run rampant, and it's never going to be solved from Washington because Washington is the swamp filled with lobbies of every kind and they always win. I say put it in a giant block grant, send it back to the states and let Nevada compete against California to see, you know, what kind of welfare you have, how big the grants are, what do you have to work wow. or not and so forth. It's the only way that we're going to avoid national bankruptcy is to bring the states back into a competitive but ball. I, I think maybe, and you're the expert on it, but I think it's simpler than that. We, we, we misstate things. It's sort of like the whole <clears throat> illegal immigration debate right. morphed into, if you're against illegal immigration, you're, you're anti-immigrant. Right. That certainly morphed into that argument. Right. But on this, it's, it's become, uh, we're, we're cutting. When we're not cutting, cutting to me, means you're going to have $100 and it's down to $80. That's a cut. Right. But when you, these days, cuts really mean slowing the rate of growth. So the, not too long ago, we had Speaker Paul Ryan blasted uh, for wanting to curtail the growth of Medicare, uh, and yet he was throwing granny off a cliff. So even curtailing or slowing the growth of these programs is the same thing as killing them. Well, that's why if you do it in the trenches, year to year, program by program, as I say, budget surgery, you never get anywhere. So but if you we would do could, what? 
I say put uh, 600 billion worth of welfare or means-tested programs, Medicaid, food stamps, cash assistance, SSI, and so forth in one big block grant, send it back to the states and allow each state to decide who's eligible, how much they get, for how long, what kind of work they need to do. Uh, you don't think you would have the possibility that the states run amok with this? If the state, it's going to be on their dime because the idea that I have and they is, have to balance it's it. One, yes, right. they have to balance it by their constitution. It's one block grant and we cut it by 5% a year for the next 20 years. So they're on notice that there's no cold turkey you take over today, but over the next 20 years, you better get this program disciplined, targeted on real need as your voters see it uh, or uh, you're going to die uh, under the well, you know any cost. politician any cost. politician Democrat or Republican who acknowledges that this is not sustainable is immediately targeted or even primaried to get thrown out I mean someone has got to have the chutzpah to sort of stand up and say this is not sustainable we can't keep going this way yeah but I think they need more imagination too we ought to say let's go back to federalism let's go back to Louis Brandeis the great American jurist who said uh, America let the states be a laboratory of democracy find a different way to pose the issue and to allocate the responsibilities we are a overly centralized bureaucratic quasi-socialist state. What should the federal government do? The federal government basically ought to take care of defense. It ought to take care of, as I say, workfare um, and uh, minimal involvement in the justice system. The rest of it should be states. Education is a state function. Community development, if you're going to waste money on it as a, a government, that's a state function. Welfare can't be managed from Washington because the welfare lobbies and, and uh, all of the people behind them them make it impossible. And at least most of those states, 46 of the 50 states, have balanced budget. They do, they have to but even beyond that, see, Republican government today in the United States exists at the state level. 33 state governors are Republican, 35 legislatures, I believe. If you want to get welfare under control, give the function back to those Republican and conservative governments that are responsive to the people and let there be a competition. If New York loves giving handouts to everybody, let the taxpayers of New York pay and pretty let soon the taxpayers of New York will be living in Florida and Nevada and Texas and a lot of other places. It's the only way in the modern world, 21st century, that we can deal with this runaway welfare state that is basically uh, driving us towards but bankruptcy. But you criticize both parties for this. For example, right. this debate in defense, and I get this all the time, when I question adding more money to defense, I would say, well, in a $600 billion budget that is darn close to funding at the Iraq war height, surely we can, we can examine where this money is going. Yeah. And then if you tell me afterwards, much like infrastructure, that we, we really do need more because it's all accounted for, then fine, maybe, uh, but I'm just saying, we're, we don't even do that. We no, just feel Neil, that. I, I think it's ridiculous. Okay, the Russian defense budget is 50 billion. Sitting here in New York in your studio with you, I can see Russia from here. The GDP of New York is 1.6 trillion. The GDP of Russia is 1.3 trillion, less than New York, 7% of the U.S. economy. It's a pipsqueak, backward economy that threatens us in no way whatsoever. And if we're spending now 12 times more than Russia, uh, that can't really so threaten More us. than our threats combined, yeah. China yes. and yeah. all. Yeah. Well, let me ask you about that, because a lot of people have said that... Um, all this defense spending started under Ronald Reagan, and, and when you were his budget director then, uh, you could argue maybe the time was right to reassess yeah. our defense commitments. Did we go too far? Yes, we did. I fought it tooth and nail because they lied at the time. The neocons said the Soviet Union was on the verge of first strike threat capacity. It was totally untrue. They built up the top line by hundreds of billions but of it dollars. But got the Russian and, Empire to fold. Uh, the Russian Empire folded on the weight of socialism and communism that never works. It had nothing to do... But they were do... plowing more into their defense. No, they were dying. Us, right? In 1981, the Soviet Union was on death's door and if we had more confidence in Washington in in capitalism 
and in free markets and in the fact that the red Ponzi in China is going to sooner or later collapse on its own weight. And if they want to build sand castles in the South China Sea, let them. It's a waste of their money. But you it's could not argue you were us. there, but with the Star Wars Defense Initiative and even the Russians, so well, that was crazy, the Soviets, whatever. But they did come to negotiate because they felt that this guy, this Ronald Reagan, would be crazy enough to to follow up on, and it did got them to consider. Well, Star Wars, uh, Star Wars was a joke. No one ever believed it. Well, they the came, Russians they, they came to the table. Well, they came to negotiate because they were going bankrupt. They were economically collapsing because they tried to run a socialist economy out of the Kremlin, and they proved that socialism is wrong, and given enough time, the threat from a socialist state will always But fast forward to today, you don't think that Donald Trump's solution with big tax cuts and all that is, is the answer either, right? You're, yeah. you're just saying we don't have the money for any of the above. Yeah, because back then we had a surplus folk, uh, uh, out in the middle of the decade. We right. could cut taxes, even raise defense. Today, we've got $10 trillion built in. You're talking about spending. There's $53 trillion of spending built in for the next decade. There's only $43 trillion of revenue under current law. I'm all for tax cuts, but you have to pay for them with spending cuts. If we cuts, go from 2 to 3% growth and maintain that, that's 50% potentially more revenue than we could... You no. Get, right? No. You don't uh, yeah, if if you could, you know, if if, do <laughs> if dogs could whistle, the world would be a chorus. You you agree with me on that? You can't whistle. In other words, mm -hmm. the the issue I don't, I've never heard of it, but the issue is not real growth; it's nominal growth, because that drives revenue. If you try to uh, send your taxes in based on in, uh, inflation-adjusted income, you'll be in jail real quick. So what counts is nominal growth, and there's already built into the forecast. 30% more nominal growth per year, nominal GDP, right, nominal right. wages, than we've had in the last 10 years. And when uh, the White House and Treasury says, well, add another percent, that's 70% more. In other words, 5% growth of nominal GDP. So we're GDP. already being rosy. So we got a, we got rosy scenario right. in spades. Okay. Right. Um, always good seeing you, I think. <laughs> okay. uh, but you are a, a great education on, on all this stuff, and he knows his numbers. Some people disagree with how dire things are, but um, it wouldn't be a segment unless Stockman scared the hell out of everybody, right? <laughs> Washington is the swamp filled with lobbies of every kind, and they always win. I say put it in a giant block grant, send it back to the states, and let Nevada compete against California to see, you know, what kind of welfare you have, how big the grants are, what do you have to wow. work or not, and so forth. It's the only way that we're going to avoid national bankruptcy is to bring the states back into a competitive but ball. I, I think maybe, and you're the expert on it, but I think it's simpler than that. We, we, we misstate things. It's sort of like the whole <clears throat> illegal immigration debate right. morphed into, if you're against illegal immigration, you're, you're anti-immigrant. Right. right. certainly morphed into that argument. Right. But on this, it's, it's become, uh, we're, we're cutting, when we're not cutting, cutting to me, means you're going to have $100 and it's down to $80. That's a cut. Right. Philosophically. But there are no votes for it. When them. you were doing it back in the yeah. early 80s uh, with Ronald Reagan, <clears throat> you ran into a buzz saw criticism that was heartless and all of this. So yeah. what happened in the end? Well, what happened in the end that there were tiny reforms to Medicaid and food stamps and, and welfare, and then over time, most of that grew back. And the difficulty today, 36 years later, is small ball uh, budget surgery dies with a thousand cuts. They need a big idea. And the big idea is to say Washington takes care of workfare with the earned income tax credit and anybody who gets a job, even at McDonald's, gets some additional help. The states are given responsibility totally for welfare, and that means a huge block grant for Medicaid, food stamps, uh, and the other... Well and on something that I haven't touched on, these the so-called cuts to Medicaid, I, I, I hasten to add that the $800 billion or so Republicans are looking to pay from spending is uh, over an increase in spending. When all is said and done, uh, Medicaid, as it stands now, will still be getting $5.7 trillion. That's how things stand now, closer to $5 trillion if the, the, the cuts come in. So the rate of growth is what slows here. It still means they get more money. And that's the problem with this so-called misnomer that these represent cuts is a big issue for former Reagan budget director David Stockman.
we lie when we talk about this stuff, right? <laughs> well, uh, unfortunately, this budget will be DBA, dead before arrival, because all these cuts I left in the vault at OMB 36 years ago. Is that right? They were rejected then, you know, the State Department, EPA 30%, cutting back on education, reducing some of the waste in the National Medical uh, uh, Research Institutes, getting rid of the corporation. This was a small sliver yeah, of the that's spending the that you could touch. Right? Yeah, but that's the problem. Uh, Trump has basically ruled out Medicare and Social Security 1.8 trillion a year. He wants more for defense, which is already vastly more than we need. That's 650 billion a year. Interest we have to pay. Veterans he's carved out. That's 200 billion a year. Homeland Security he wants more of in walls. That's 65 billion a year. Uh, uh, law enforcement uh, and so forth is 50 billion and he wants more of that. So the point is they're focused on a smaller and smaller tiny fragment of the budget. You can't make, I would make the cut myself. Well, let's talk about the food programs. stamp thing. These days, it's hmm. under the umbrella of SNAP, I guess. It's right, a that's the name. Food stamps. And yet, 44 million receive this type of support for food. Now, now, no one wants to take food away from people, but the fact is, it used to be 28 million as recently as 2008, about 15 million eight years prior to that. So, if we have 44 million people in this country who genuinely need this type of support, that's third world country problems, right? I mean, it's even worse. There's 110 million people in this country who live in households that are getting food stamps, Medicaid, or other means-tested assistance. That's one third of the population. But it's always portrayed as you're killing off, you know, grandma or the, the grandchild. Well, uh, look, it's welfareism run rampant. And it's never going to be solved from Washington because 